Thank you, President Hoyer. Now we move to the question uh, section of this uh, event. I have one request from uh, Vince uh, Chadwick from DevEx. Perhaps we can, uh, we can connect him and give him the floor to ask his question. Happy New Year, Vince. Hi, um, I won't use my video for the connection purposes, but Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I've got a question about uh, COVAX and vaccines. I know that the EIB um, put forward the 400 million euro loan uh, to uh, COVAX, but there's also been concern about whether that initiative is not um, is, is feasible actually, and whether we're going to see low income countries be vaccinated many years after uh, those in the West. Um, I'd be interested in President Hoyer's take on on global vaccine equity and whether there's more that the EIB can do and whether there's more other MDBs can do, um, bearing in mind that I'm conscious you've already done a lot in 2020. Um, and my second question is about the EIB dedicated windows under the EU's 2021-2027 um, development budget. I wanted to ask whether President Hoyer views those as sufficient um, firepower to meet the ambitions of the EIB, including in the context of a possible um, EIB development banker, etc. Thanks. Thank you very much. The access to vaccine and medication is one of the key um, ethical issues of our times. And in addition to that, it is a question of stability around the world. As you know, I have a long background of decades in foreign affairs. And I must say that I'm really worried, if I would be really worried, if we would not address the challenges of COVID-19 with a global view. This can become a question of enormous instabilities and a question of enormous social unrest. It can develop into a question of war and peace. So therefore, we have been active together with our partners in the World Health Organization, with which we have a very good cooperation, together with our partners in the European Commission, with Ursula von der Leyen on top, and with uh, philanthropy, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, on the development of schemes where we would make sure that for every vaccine that is shot into an arm of a citizen in the European Union, there is one shot already available for somebody in least developing countries, least developed countries. And we need to continue that work. COVAX has been a good start. Gavi is a great initiative. But we have to take that seriously. This is not luxury. This is global responsibility. And at a time when the European Union is seeking to preserve and expand its strategic autonomy in the world, if it wants to play a global role, and it needs to do so in order to preserve its own interests, then we need to have a look at this as well. And we are, I believe, in the avant-garde in addressing uh, this issue. I take that extremely seriously. Now, the second question uh, re uh, refers to the, to the development budget in general. I think uh, what the European Commission has achieved there with the development budget is a considerable progress. And of course, we have the ambitions to participate in that. The development policy needs to be seen strategically as well. And development policy needs to be, needs. Development policy needs leverage. We need to move the private sector into the responsibility for development objectives. And this is why the EU bank, the financial arm of the European Union, is also relevant for our activities outside the European Union. And there I see clearly a link in the context of strategic autonomy between innovation, climate, and development. This area from the technology side is still one of the few where Europe still has an edge. We are the avant-garde there. And we should preserve that status and expand it. And this is why I believe the European Union needs more activities of its bank in this field in order to multiply the efforts that we can bring about together. 
President, if you agree, perhaps we could bring in Christoph Kuhn uh, to give a little more detail on the vaccine sure. aspect. Christoph, please join us. Thank you, President. Um, Christoph Kuhn is the Director for Mandate Management. He is uh, particularly familiar with our negotiations with our international partners in this field. So please, Christoph. Thank you, President, and uh, good morning, everybody. I, I can happily compliment what President Hoyer just said, which is basically that um, together with our partners, and notably the Commission, but also Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we have structured a transaction with COVAX uh, that would, on one side, allow them to indeed leverage additional 400 million euros to make available vaccines um, to the development world by actually utilizing both EIB's expertise in structuring the transactions for COVAX, which was not an easy endeavor, but we did in record time um, to then allow COVAX to actually enter into purchase agreements with European um, developers and manufacturers, but then also to, to bring in the EFSD, which in itself is a leveraged instrument that allows the Commission to make the maximum impact or create the maximum impact based on a limited um, budget. Um, this is a landmark transaction that we in operations of EAB are extremely proud of. Thank you, President. Over. Thank you very much, Christoph. I have another addition, if I may, uh, Matteo, uh, because I've said in, in my introduction that we do not limit ourselves to the support of the development and production of vaccines. We also look at diagnostics and we also look at medication. And uh, I think there are some interesting developments there as well. But beyond that, we see now more than ever with highest probability, this will not have been the last pandemic. So we need to be better prepared next time. This is, for instance, why we have played and we are playing a substantial part in structuring the so-called AMR, the Antimicrobial Resistance Action Fund. And uh, there is considerable progress also in this field, uh, all under the headline, better preparation for the next challenge of this dimension. Okay, we go on to uh, Isabella Bufacchi from Sole 24 Ore, followed by Kyra Taylor and Mathieu Bion. Isabella. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I have two questions. One question is on your key role for SMEs. And uh, um, this year, looking forward to 2021, is uh, expected to be also here of huge insolvencies by the, uh, for the SMEs. And you mentioned how crucial important will be that the viable SMEs will have credit. And from your point of view, from your platform, how do you see this challenge of uh, a year of huge insolvencies by SMEs and which sectors could come out of it, of this crisis, better than other sectors. And then, if I may, also, if you, you would like to comment on the role of the new uh, European Guarantee Fund that was created for the pandemic with other instruments from the ESM and SURE, and how you see this new instrument coming up and what's its role and how important it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, two very, very relevant questions. Number one on SMEs. Every year, you have SMEs or mid-caps or big companies who can't make it and have to disappear from the markets. This is normal. But this year, we have seen a situation where basically healthy companies, viable companies, have come under pressure and to the risk of life. And it makes sense to support these companies so on the national level and on the European level, huge programs have been set up and I would like to ask uh, Alain Godard to complement my remarks on this for SMEs a bit. But what is clear is that there have been protection schemes um, against companies going officially bust. This has artificially prolonged the life of some companies would, which would have gone down anyway. And when these programs run out, 
these protection schemes run out, then you have a huge number of SMEs who go down. They should have probably go down before, but now they will. And this is why we have to make sure that those SMEs who can make it get the full support. They are suffering from revenue shortages. They are not suffering from a bad business idea or a bad setup of their companies. So we will continue to put SMEs in the center of our activities, as has always been in the history of the European Investment Bank, and in particular, the European Investment Fund. And therefore, I'd like to ask uh, Alain Godard to complement this a bit. Thank you, President, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, indeed, uh, the SMEs have been uh, particularly impacted by the uh, COVID crisis. Uh, from a liquidity point of view, first of all, uh, starting in March, April uh, last year. And EIF has uh, SAV, um, dedicated uh, institution within the EIB group uh, supporting SMEs has, has been ex extremely uh, active uh, this year. And we will continue to do so in, uh, in 2021. And uh, I'd like indeed to take the, the questions on on the, the, the product that will be delivered to SMEs. Uh, indeed, after this liquidity crisis that we have been uh, facing, we will see more and more uh, uh, entities, but SMEs in particular, who will be uh, uh, suffering from default. And uh, I, I just want to echo uh, an analysis that has been just published uh, yesterday from the Association for Financial Market in Europe who estimate, together with the uh, European Commission, that about 720 billion would be the capital gap for firms in Europe. So we see that indeed there, there would be a huge uh, challenge from this year in order to support uh, specifically uh, SMEs in their uh, um, capacity to restore their uh, own funds and their capacity to invest for the future. For that, and you mentioned in your second question, uh, the uh, EGF, I'd like to mention that the EGF is one of the first program initiated by uh, EIB, who is uh, going to offer a large part of uh, the program in uh, the form of equity instruments, specifically about 20% of this program will be dedicated uh, through equity instruments. So we think that uh, with, with this program, we will, uh, this will give us both uh, for EIB and EF the, the means uh, to be more impactful in 2021 when it comes to SMEs and their uh, need for more capital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alain. Let me continue on EGF. Uh, EGF, not everybody's familiar with this is a new instrument that we invented in 2020. And it's a really interesting effort because it's an off-balance sheet instrument for which the member states gave us a guarantee of all together 25 billion euros. And we hope to be able to leverage this to a amount that can go up all the way to 200 billion. But this is not the, the, the key point, whether it's going to be 170 or 200 billion at the end of the day, because that is a question also of the risk dimensions of the individual projects that we promote here. But the key thing is that uh, a new instrument has been established that uh, is very, very, very uh, complex and quick. And this is a rare combination. Uh, of course, it took some time to get it rolling. Uh, but uh, by the end of the year already, we had been close to 6 billion euros. We expect roughly another close to 50 billion for the next uh, couple of months, six months, as a matter of fact. And uh, this is ramping up now very, very, very quickly and, and uh, efficiently. Uh, of course, it has to be also governed in a proper way. So it is a question of the uh, experience we have with the investors committee that uh, the contributors committee that is responsible for providing this guarantee and therefore uh, these first experience have been uh, very very important for us i would propose that uh, i should give the floor on this briefly to the director general for operations monsieur jean christophe laloux who is uh, 
dealing with EGF issues day by day. Jean Christophe. Uh, thank you, President, uh, and uh, a good morning um, to everyone. Um, so, yes, President, the Pan European Guarantee Fund is indeed uh, an exceptional instrument for the European Investment Bank because it is directly powered by EU member states' money outside of our balance sheet. So, what is important to note here is that um, uh, we shall provide um, relief. Uh, to uh, uh, SMEs and to uh, mid-cap companies, so uh, mid-sized companies, essentially three, through, uh, 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 through three types of interventions. Uh, Alain has already uh, described uh, the first one, which is we shall provide equity, uh, so own funds, uh, to, um, uh, to SMEs and to mid-cap companies through two channels. On the one hand, the European Investment Fund will invest equity into investment funds, which in turn will invest equity into SMEs and, uh, and mid-caps. And on the other hand, EIB will continue, as it has done in the past, to invest equity directly into mid-sized companies. And the President, for example, alluded to a number of investments we did in, the, in med tech companies using such uh, equity type instruments. So that's channel number one. Channel number two is that we shall provide guarantees to portfolios of SME credits generated by banking institutions that will in turn allow these banking institutions to extend more credits to companies that require such credits also and notably in the context of the COVID uh, crisis. And the third and final channel I wish to mention is that EIB will use this money to relay, to amplify some of the national schemes that are being set up in various uh, member states in order to uh, provide more credits to SMEs and to mid-caps. So these are the three essential channels we have already uh, uh, more than 5 billion euros of operations approved, and uh, 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 the bulk of the work will happen in the first half of this year. And as the president mentioned, indeed, speed will be uh, of essence, and uh, we are uh, full speed in, in, in delivery mode with a pipeline of operations, which is already pretty much full. Thank you, president. Thank you very much, Jean-Christophe. We move on. There's a question from Kyra Taylor uh, from Euractive. Please, uh, if you can, activate your, your video so we, you, you can actually uh, ask your question. We can see you. It's merrier. And this will be followed by Mathieu Bion, Hannah uh, Breton, and then Anna Hubert. Hi, can you hear me? We can. And we can even see you. Brilliant. Um, so I've got two questions around the climate side. Um, how much uh, of the EIB funding will go towards natural gas and how much of climate dedicated funds will go towards gas? And then my second question is, uh, what standards will be used to define um, what is a green project uh, if the EU taxonomy is delayed? Thanks. Thank you very much. To put it mildly, gas is over. And uh, this is a serious departure from, from the past. But without the end to the use of unabated fossil fuels, we will not be able to reach the climate targets. So this is very serious for us. The problem is in the concrete cases. Because we need to see that we have member states who have been putting all the eggs into the basket of gas because they are dependent upon gas. And these member states, these regions, they need transitions and they need alternatives and they must have support for the future. It's similar to the move away from, from, from coal mining. I mean, those who have been working in coal mines for the last uh, 100 years will not become the head of a digital startup in two weeks. So transformation support is necessary. And this is what is 
the objective of the European Commission of Ursula von der Leyen when she's talking about just transition. So we need to take the realities that the future does not lie in fossil fuels anymore. And I think we have to show credibility on, on that question. Uh, now I've got the second point was? The taxonomy. The taxonomy, the taxonomy is well, delayed. Taxonomy. I mean, this is a, a huge issue politically and practically. I, I told you, I reminded you that we issued the first green bonds in 2007. And there were very quickly first followers who presented so-called green bonds. And the markets found out very quickly that there was a lot of cheating going on, greenwashing. And this is very, very detrimental because we ask investors from around the world to give us their money for green projects and they have a right to be reassured that this money really flows into ecologically correct, biodiversity correct projects and need to guarantee that. This is why we were the avant-garde in developing the green bond principles on the European level and later on on the international level. And the European Commission has the ambition, the excellent ambition, to make sure that in the European Union everything that is called green or ecologically correct or whatever is green or ecologically correct. This is the order that needs to be brought into this market. And we have learned from the experience with green bonds, and we need to have that here as well. Now, this is a complicated thing. And what it requires is to produce transparency, accountability, and reliability. Otherwise, we don't get investors who give us, in our case last year, 10 billion euros to, for investment in these fields. And on the global scale, it's much more. The, this market for green bonds is now far above 800 billion euros. So this taxonomy, the, the base idea, the Greek word taxes in there, that means order, system, this is needed. Now, when I talk to business associations around the European Union, I get a completely different perception of taxonomy. Either those who see the word tax in it first, and that's of course erroneous, and secondly, you see people who are afraid of a bureaucratic monster because they see regulations that covers a couple of hundred pages and the companies and associations who have to deal with it need to go through that. That is deterring. So we need to make sure that we preserve this great idea of order in the market of transparency, accountability, reliability, sustainability, and not let it uh, slide into something that is uh, connotated negatively because of uh, it's perceived as a bureaucratic monster. President, if you agree, there are uh, a couple of questions about the taxonomy. They go in more or less in the same direction. Perhaps we can bring in Chris Hurst, Absolutely. the Director General of uh, Projects at the bank, if we can uh, bring him up. Also, also in relation to energy and transport specifically, um, how the taxonomy will impact on our work um, in these areas. Chris. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Um, the, the, there was a, a specific question about what standards we would use uh, before we have arrived to, to, to the, the final delegated act for the taxonomy. And if you visit the EAB website, you will find uh, the, the Climate Bank Roadmap, where we set out what our standards will be until such time as we do have the delegated act. And those are largely based on the, the technical expert group that formulated the proposals for the taxonomy and also with our work with multi multilateral uh, development banks. So we have a set of clearly defined green criteria that we'll continue to use until such time as we have the taxonomy and we have committed to, to align to the extent possible with the taxonomy. Um, those those criteria take uh, also deal with uh, issues around transport and around the vehicle emissions that we would use to, to decide what sort of vehicles we should and should not be we should not not be funding. If there's any other additional questions on specific questions on transport, I'd be happy to answer them too. There is there is a follow up question, and I would like to ask. Uh, 
uh, Mathieu Bion and Hannah uh, Breton to uh, have a little patience because this question goes exactly in the direction of what we're talking about now. From Jan Strubczewski, I hope I'm not uh, slaughtering your name, from Reuters. Uh, I would follow up on what the president just said on gas is over. If that is the case, why does Germany insist on building Nord Stream 2 and the EU is not blocking it? Uh, I suggest that you take the next opportunity of a press conference in Berlin to address the issue there. We are not involved in Nord Stream 2. Okay, so uh, let's go on to uh, Mathieu, Mathieu Bion. Hi, yes, good morning. Uh, actually, I had the question on the uh, backstop, the 25 billion guarantee funds. So it was uh, uh, answered already, but um, I take the opportunity to ask you a question on next generation EU. Will you invest in the, uh, in the bonds that the, the commission will uh, launch? And um, what's your take on the agreement uh, between the Parliament and the Council on Invest EU, is the, the, the volume of the guarantee uh, enough uh, from your point of view? And um, even the windows, there was a, an idea to have a, a window on strategic uh, investments that has disappeared. Do you think it was uh, the right decision uh, made? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think considerable progress has been made between the EU institutions, in particular with the Parliament. And uh, I think it is, makes sense, to, if you want to go into the details, to give that opportunity to Monsieur Lalou as well. He has been following the negotiation process very, very closely. Thank you, President. Um, so from EIB's perspective, um, InvestEU um, is a program that uh, relays what we started uh, with the Juncker plan that will provide uh, both in EIB and EAF uh, the, same, um, the same type of, of opportunities to, to structure investment and to leverage on public funds in order to do more of EIB and to get indeed credit protections for the things that matter. So that is very positive. This is both true for EIB and, 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 and indeed for, for, for EIF. There will be new windows that will be created under the program, which is also very interested, like uh, the social window, for example, which, would, uh, which, which will come on, on in addition. But it is true as well that um, a number of things have been uh, have been uh, um, uh, arbitrated um, uh, during the negotiation. Not everything could be done, and the member states had difficult choices to make. Uh, the solvency instrument, in particular, uh, was uh, was taken out of uh, uh, of uh, the, the the windows of opportunities, and we are at the moment uh, looking uh, into the possibility, uh, both in EIB and EAF. Uh, to uh, direct some of our operations uh, in, in, in a direction that had been taken by the solvency instrument. From EIB's perspective, um, this uh, InvestEU and EIB and EIF, InvestEU will represent a volume of operations in slight uh, decrease uh, compared to uh, the previous years of, of, of the Juncker plan. Uh, we could indeed have uh, done from an operational perspective uh, with more, but we also have to understand indeed that not everything can be done and difficult arbitrations have got to be made. In any case, uh, we shall be ready and uh, we shall continue to, to innovate uh, on the basis of, of, of this instrument uh, to come up with, uh, with also new means of supporting uh, European companies in, in line with, with the EU objectives. Thank you, President. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on to Hannah Breton uh, from Politico. If we manage to find her, if not, perhaps uh, she can uh, type in. Uh, 
question was if the EIB uh, intends to invest in the next generation EU, the, the bonds that the Commission will uh, launch. On the bond issuance, uh, you are putting a very, very interesting question because uh, that is, of course, not totally, but in this dimension, new territory for the European Union. And of course, there is a intense dialogue going on between those who are on the markets every day, like, like ESM or EIB. And uh, of course, we are discussing this with the Commission. I would like to ask the Director General for Finance, our Treasurer, uh, Bertrand de Mazière, to take the floor on this. Where do we stand on the issuance of the, let's so to speak, Commission bonds? Sure, can you hear me? Hello? We can. Yeah, okay. Um, in fact, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of an awkward question because uh, uh, the reality is that uh, the, the Commission and the EIB are two uh, separate legal persons. So by definition, uh, the, uh, the, uh, one is not responsible for the funding program of the other. But it is sure that we are, uh, as you said, President, we are in close uh, connection and close discussion with them, and I would say intellectual cooperation. Uh, certainly, uh, the, uh, uh, the emergence of the European Union as a major uh, issuer is something that was well prepared uh, in terms of communication with the markets, and the first, uh, the first bonds issued by the Commission uh, at the end of last year were extremely uh, successful events. Uh, I expect this to, to continue. Um, we, um, again, we, we, we exchange regularly about uh, market uh, perspectives, about, um, uh, let's say, the, 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 the way uh, the programs can uh, develop uh, together or in, in parallel. We will even uh, second uh, two uh, front officers, two, uh, two specialists in uh, capital markets, the uh, European Commission in the next few weeks. Uh, but I think that's all I can say on this, on this, uh, because once again, I insist, uh, we are not managing the funding program of the European Union, and the European Union is not managing the funding program of the EAB. Very good. Uh, we move on to uh, Valentina Wiesner from the Czerny List. Uh, if she can is, hear me? We can hear you. Uh, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what about uh, non-performing loans? Do you have a huge rise of non-performing loans due to pandemic and what will be your policy about it? Well, this is a very serious issue for the member states and their banks and uh, the situation in the member states is uh, different from place to place. We had a very thorough discussion on this yesterday in the ECOFIN Council. But EIB has not been part of that discussion because this is not an issue in which we are directly involved. So uh, it is a little bit awkward if I give advice to uh, people uh, on this difficult thing, although I'm not directly involved and affected. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the, uh, it is in the very best hands of the member states and, and, the, and the ECOFIN. Okay. There is a, uh, there was a question typed up on, uh, on the uh, consultation that we plan to run on transport policy. I wonder, President, if we can call in uh, Chris Hurst again to Definitely. talk about He that. is the expert on these consultation process, in particular when it, it's ec ecology related. So please, Chris. Hello, could you, I, I don't see the specific question, is it on the chat? This is, this is, this is no, it is, uh, it is um, uh, typed up from, from the outside. Basically, it is about uh, the, the, the impact of the taxonomy on transport, but also on the timeline and the modalities of our consultation uh, in relation to transport policy. Well, a, a significant part of the transport policy is related to climate was dealt with under our climate bank roadmap, which set out the criteria that we would use in order for both for vehicles, but also for investments in infrastructure in particular, the fact that we would no longer invest in airport uh, capacity expansion, though we would invest in greening airports. 
and we have a rather uh, robust and, and tough criteria for, for road capacity expansion. Now, of course, there's a lot of transport policy that goes beyond simply questions about climate. There's all sorts of questions about other environmental impacts, about safety, about access. Uh, and, and so that will be part of our, our, our broader transport policy, which will be subject of public consultation. And we expect to come really in the summer. We're in the most in the process of now preparing a set of uh, internal documents that we will we will propose to, to stakeholders and we're expecting that process will start in the summer where we'll start uh, engaging engaging with, with you and, and, and other stakeholders. Very good. I think that was the last question on my list. So uh, perhaps we can leave one minute to, uh, uh, for people to uh, tame technology in case they are trying to uh, uh, to, to connect or, or put across their question. But that, uh, if that is not the case, perhaps we can bring this uh, momentous beginning to a momentous day uh, to an end. And thank you all for, for attending. And thank you for your questions. And uh, President, have a very good day. Thank you very much. All the best.